My name is Ed Fay. I'm the University Librarian at the University of Bristol. And this morning we're beginning with a discussion of inclusive libraries. Inclusion is a foundational value for our libraries and our understanding and practice continues to develop. There are issues of equality due to race, gender, sexual orientation, disability and neurodiversity, globalization and international cultures, and widening participation in higher education. And of course, how any of these intersect for any individual engaging with our libraries and how we facilitate student success and a sense of belonging as part of our learning communities. This morning, we will hear from colleagues from three institutions about community-led approaches to collecting, representation and indigenization, and EDI library champions. So first we will hear from Justine Mann. Justine Mann is project archivist at the University of East Anglia and works as a literary archivist, focusing primarily on acquiring material from writers from the 21st century and currently collecting the archives of underrepresented poets. Justine will talk to us about a community-led approach to inclusivity, new ways of collecting, collaborating and curating. Justine, over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about work underway at the University of East Anglia and thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to be talking about a Mellon Foundation funded interdisciplinary project towards the Centre for Contemporary Poetry in the Archive, which began in June 2022. And its key objective is to build a community led collection of diverse poetry in the archive here at UVA. So I'm going to focus on three areas in particular, our methodology and really getting under the skin of what we mean by community led and diverse, the role of the research library in this collaborative project and the potential for its wider application um, as a collection model. So first of all, I want to give you some context to the collecting practices within the archive at the University of East Anglia as it's relevant to the project as a whole. So UEA was founded in 1963, so it's a relatively young collecting institution, but it has an interesting history in the discipline of creative writing. It was the first university to offer a master's in creative writing founded by Malcolm Bradbury and Angus Wilson in 1970. And it has a number of successful alumni, Ian McEwen, Kashi Shiguru, Tracy Chevalier, and Enright, to name just a few. And the writers, Angela Carter, Ali Smith, and Rose Tremaine, all taught at the institution. So through its year-round International Literary Festival, it's also made uh, or forged relationships with major writers, Arthur Miller and Doris Lessing amongst them. So the British Archive of Contemporary Writing is a collection that sits within the wider university archives and was developed in 2015. And prior to this, UEA didn't have a proactive strategic approach to collecting literary manuscripts, but its literary reputation and those relationships I mentioned meant that we were offered donations. And most notably, um, a vast archive from the Nobel laureate, Doris Lessing, author of The Golden Notebook. I want to say a little bit about an innovative loan model we have, as this is key to our being awarded uh, funding from the Mellon Foundation and key really to this project. So traditionally, institutions either purchase archives, receive donations, or occasionally take material on loan, usually with a minimum of 20 years. Um, and individual archives are often taken in towards the end of someone's career or posthumously. So there is a significant and sometimes competitive market for the archives of preeminent writers. And UEA doesn't have an acquisitions budget for archive collections, so purchases are out of the question. Um, another the complication is that writers are often freelancers, so disinclined to loan material for long periods in case they find they need to sell at a later date, either to fund writing time or in the form of a pension. So the traditional 20 year deposit model doesn't really work in contemporary collecting either. So in order to grow collections that our students, researchers and visitors would want to engage with, we developed the storehouse model. And in order to form this model, we consulted with writers, with literary agents, with Society of Authors, which represents writers and also literary archive valuers. So having uh, formed the model, uh, we collect discrete material from writers earlier in their career as a temporary loan and with the idea that it can be returned to the writer at six months notice should they wish to move or sell their archive at a later date. A storehouse model deposit might be correspondence, working papers, notebooks, and manuscripts relating to one or two literary works. 
and the selection of writers is led by the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and is scrutinised by a government group made up of faculty and library staff. So we have 22 writers archives, nine acquired under the storehouse model and have a busy programme of archive based teaching across the spectrum of undergraduate, postgraduate and PGR teaching. And we've engaged in National Lottery and Arts Council funded projects and a variety of public engagement activities, including exhibitions and outreach programmes within the wider community. In a research context, working with archive depositors much earlier in their careers has allowed us to better understand their working practices in a digital environment and the characteristics of a 21st century archive, together with the implications and opportunities this presents for an archive's digital infrastructure. Uh, we advocate for digital humanities and literary scholars, institutional archivists and archive depositors to be at the heart of archival collaboration, uh, to fully realize the affordances of those digital collections and their potential for research. And the involvement of academic staff in the archive has led to interesting interdisciplinary research and publications and one such publication was read by Mellon Foundation staff. So in April 2021, the Mellon Foundation's public knowledge program contacted me directly, and they felt some frustration that collecting institutions were not yet building archive collections of underrepresented writers, and wondered whether the dynamic nature of the storehouse model might be a mechanism to escalate this. It so happened that prior to the uh, pandemic, a proposal to build a collection of contemporary poetry archives and increase the diversity of our collections in our governance group had already been approved. So incredibly, Mellon were inviting us to apply for funding to enable an already held ambition. It doesn't happen very often, so a great opportunity. However, the Mellon uh, funding and that invitation pushed our ambitions further by testing a new methodology, they were um, advocating a community-led approach, not community collecting, but community-led, and by community-led, Melament poet-led. So over the course of six months, between May and October 2021, I worked with a poetry critic and academic, Jeremy Noll Todd, to write the funding proposal, with Mellon programme staff offering advice on various iterations, which is their typical approach. So it's a long haul. Um, uh, Mellon Committee met and approved it at the end of 2021, and we commenced the project in June 2022. It was essential for the credibility of this project to place a poet at the heart of the leadership team, and we developed a role description and advertised it widely. And Will Harris, the successful candidate pictured here, is an acclaimed writer of Chinese, Indonesian and British heritage. Born and raised in uh, London, his debut book, Rendang, won the forward prize for Best First Collection 2020 and was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize in 2021. And his latest collection, Brother Poem, has just been published. His role as visiting poetry fellow is to consult and uh, represent the four poets and residents who are depositing their archives with us. And I'll say a little bit more about this methodology later. So now to the definition of an underrepresented writer. The Mellon Foundation highlighted BIPOC poets as a priority area for collecting. I'm sharing a statistic here about the UK, which demonstrates that as late as 2017-18, the London Review of Books, one of 26 publications to be surveyed as part of research, only commissioned white poetry critics who wrote exclusively about white poets, the vast majority men. The research was led by the UK poet and critic Sandeep Palmer, a member of our advisory group, Palmer is a co-founder of Ledbury Poetry Critics, which mentors marginalised writers in writing poetry criticism. And Palmer's research had identified that structural exclusion operates across many intersections of identity concurrently, including around sexuality, gender and class. So it follows that poets at the intersections of these forms of discrimination are particularly disadvantaged. So mindful of intersections and in consultation with our advisory group, we started to define what, the under, what underrepresentation means in a British and Irish context. It extended to include poetry, which is innovative in form and which uses marginalised dialectics. Dialects, sorry. We're aware our project builds on pre-existing initiatives like the Blood Axe Poetry Archive at Newcastle, the British Library's Between Two Worlds Poetry and Translation Archive, and the Mayday Room's Radical Poetry Archive. So taking the definition of underrepresented, we then worked with the advisory group on our shortlisting criteria. We moved on from talking about underrepresented groups towards thinking about the various critical markers each writer would need to meet to be included in the archive. And they're mentioned at the bottom there. 
So once we had our definition and our critical markers, the group was invited to nominate the four poets to be archived during this proof of concept project. And poets with the most nominations were invited to deposit in the archive. So now I'll say a little bit more about the methodology and stakeholders involved in the project. I've talked about the project team already, but the poets um, are depositing a discrete collection of archive material, reflecting on the process, producing creative critical responses and running workshops in Norfolk public libraries where participants are invited to respond to their archive through creative activities. And this will form another layer of interpretation in the archive. And the poets are paid for 14 days of their time. Our public engagement partners, the National Centre for Writing and the Public Library Service in Norfolk work with us on audience development, allowing us to reach participants the university finds harder to target. Uh, the advisory group scrutinises proposals and approaches and provides critical feedback. And the stakeholder consultation group includes members from the US, Canada and the UK and representation from the International Council on Archives. This allows us to highlight our approach to see if it resonates with different institutions and territories. So we have uh, eight months left of an 18 month project. So a number of the milestones listed here have already been achieved. This period has really been about establishing the various groups, developing those relationships, particularly with the poets as they deposit material and carrying out consultation. All participants have been funded for their time and this affects who becomes a member of your various stakeholder groups and the voices you have influencing the project. You definitely can't rely on voluntary contributions from freelancers. Uh, Mellon really understood this. Other funders sometimes don't. If you really want diversity, you need to fund people's time, however small their contribution. So there are emerging questions and challenges that the project's confronting, and these will be written up fully in the final report at the end of the project. But we're encountering a healthy suspicion from the poets in terms of uh, how they regard the institution. Why you? Why your location? What's in it for you? Um, from scholars uh, who are questioning the authenticity of the archive. If it's a discrete selection curated by the depositor, is it really an archive? And also the depositors are showing a, a, a reluctance or um, some reservations about sharing digital material. I think the separation between work and private life for a writer is not straightforward. Sometimes there is uh, personal information. And although there are, you know, um, embargoes available um, and tools exist. Um, the trust needs to be built over a longer time with writers and individuals. So here are the remaining deliverables for our project. Events, it's more of a dissemination phase, so events, uh, symposium, a public outreach program and a final launch, reports and publications, including a pamphlet of creative critical responses from the poets, physical and digital exhibitions at UEA, but also in Norfolk libraries, the archives will be launched and scholarly publications will be written. So I just wanted to say something about the um, library's role in this. The funder came directly to me as archivist rather than to a scholar because it was about collections growth. Academic scholarship within poetry and literary criticism was absolutely vital to the integrity of this project, but collection management is key to sustainability of the collections in the longer term. Um, the many moving parts of the project and their interdependencies on collection management and infrastructure meant that it made sense for me as archivist to oversee the budget and to act as project manager for the entire project. To avoid silo working, the project team meets weekly and shares decisions. So poets, academic and archivists shape one another's outputs and learn from each other. It's a genuine collaboration. The role of visiting poetry fellow as a bridge between the underrepresented poets and the institution, building trust, sharing constraints, scepticism and concerns, as well as desired outcomes, has been absolutely vital. So finally, the potential legacy of the project. Um, in terms of next steps, if successful, we'd like to expand our work and identify UK and international partners to work with us. It would be great to see a wider adoption of alternative collecting models elsewhere to speed growth in representative contemporary collecting, but I think further research is needed to identify barriers and opportunities at other institutions. On a personal level, it's my first time as co-investigator on a research project, and it's been a fantastic experience. I think library and archive staff should feel emboldened to take a lead in developing grant proposals, and this is actively being encouraged by AHRC and RO UK, 
drawing in scholarly subject expertise from within the academic community is always possible. And finally, winning research income really makes internal stakeholders take notice and can be valuable in making a case for investment and infrastructure. Thank you for listening. Many thanks, Justine. I'm sure that will have led to many questions arising for those of us listening to you this morning, and we'll look forward very much to exploring those with you at the Q&A session uh, towards the end of the session this morning. We're going to hear next from Michelle Blake, University Librarian at Tawara Wananga Owakato, Kim Tyree, Kaitoa Puka, University Librarian at Auckland University of Technology, and Sue Roberts, University Librarian at the University of Auckland. Many of you will know Sue and Michelle from their work in the UK. Kim joins them to share some insights from the indigenization journeys they and their libraries are on, and this will be a pre-recorded session. So over to you. Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai ke tou tato korero. We would like to begin today by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of the land on which you are today, and to mihi or greet and acknowledge to our colleagues at both Komzo and RLUK. Ko Michelle Blake toku ingoa. Kia ora, I'm Michelle Blake, I'm the University Librarian at Te Whare, Wānanga o Waikato, the University of Waikato. I'm here today with my colleagues Kim Tairi from AUT and Sue Roberts from the University of Auckland. And we've chosen uh, Whakatoki, which is a, a Māori proverb, um, and these play an important and large role within Māori culture and are used often as a reference point. Um, and we've used this Whakatoki at the bottom of our slide that you can see which in English, what is the most important thing in the world? The answer, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. And that's really what we're going to talk to you about today, our journey in Aotearoa, New Zealand, koutou tangata for the people. Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Kim Tairi tōku ingoa, he kaitoha pokahou ki te wānana aranui o Tamaki Makaurau. Kia ora, hello, my name is Kim Tairi and I'm the University Librarian at Auckland University of Technology here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it is my pleasure to start this session with a karakia. Now karakia are traditional incantations and they're used to acknowledge our ancestors, our tūpuna and our atua, our Māori deities. And in this context, they can be used to create a safe space for us to meet. Kia inoi tato. Tutaramai i runga, tutaramai i raro, tutaramai i roto, tutaramai i waho. Kia tau ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, haumie, huie, taikie. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Sue Roberts toku ingoa, manu take te tumihiranga, wai papato matarō. Hi, I'm Sue Roberts, Director of Libraries and Learning Services here at the University of Auckland. We thought it would be helpful to place our work on indigenising libraries in our national context. We are members of CONSUL, the Council of Aotearoa New Zealand University Libraries, which is the collective leadership of Aotearoa New Zealand's academic libraries. We are small, there are eight of us, but we are powerful. As you will see on this slide, this is our strategy kete. Our a kete is a basket, um, which is our collective commitment to working together to progressing these shared goals. You will see that we are committed to Te Triti o Waitangi, the founding document of Aotearoa, and to the partnership with Tangata Whenua, with Māori, that this requires. It is this commitment that has driven the indigenisation work we are sharing with you today. You will also see in our strat strategic kete, the pillar, He Tangata Rawe, which means amazing people. He Tangata Rawe, as part of our strategy, is about nurturing and growing our amazing people. In doing that, we aim to create and foster environments that are culturally safe, inclusive, and encourage diversity. 
We also nurture and grow Māori and Pacific staff, aiming to increase numbers and representation at all levels in our libraries. We also focus on enhancing the cultural capabilities of all staff. Underpinning the work that we do together as consul are values. Values like whakawhanaungatanga and kotahitanga. These are about creating mutually beneficial shared experiences and relationships that are mana enhancing. Massey University Library defines mana enhancing as respectful interactions where all the members of the university community work collaboratively in a partnership way at every opportunity, thus enabling a person's mana, their dignity, their power, their influence, their status to flourish. Library leaders must recognise that individuals within the organisation and teams will be at different stages on their indigenization journeys and uh, that we need to support people in their learning in this space. Also, consul are titariti led, which means respecting and enacting Titiriti o Waitangi, which is the founding document of Aotearoa New Zealand uh, that was signed in 1840. And it is a contractual agreement between the Indigenous peoples of Aotearoa New Zealand uh, and uh, then the British Crown, but now the New Zealand government. The other uh, values that we practice are tika, pono, mea aroha. So tika is about doing things uh, the right way, doing things correctly. Pono is about uh, respect, uh, integrity, and uh, aroha is about compassion and understanding. So Consul is a uh, values-based uh, organisation or collective of university libraries. Although each of us is on our own journey, a number of common themes have emerged from the indigenisation work that we've all been doing. We've represented these on a thicky or an octopus or squid on each of its tentacles and we're going to pick up and talk about some of these common themes in the next few slides. Now, Kim has already talked about the values which underpin the indigenization work that we've been doing. And she's also going to pick up around the new ways of working. Sue is going to talk about leadership and really how you make indigenization a strategic priority. Finally, I'll focus on rethinking our recruitment and making sure that we build capacity across all of our staff. Indigenisation requires different ways of working. And when you partner or collaborate with Māori, there is definitely a preference for working collectively. It can require more time because the collective is inclusive. Everyone is given the opportunity to contribute their ideas and thoughts. And this is often done through wānanga, and wānanga are best described as forum, where you can get together and meet and deliberate and discuss and consider the ideas of all of those present. The other things to consider when uh, working with Māori, so we've touched on tanga, which is about building shared experiences, and kotahitanga, which is about working collectively. But it's also important to meet at the right time and place, and that there is an element of reciprocity uh, involved in this work. 
The expectation uh, when working with Māori is that there is utu or balance and reciprocity that flows back to the community, uh, whether that is the iwi or nations or the hapū uh, family groupings. The other things to consider are the place of kawa and tikana, ceremony and custom customary practice. The karakia that we started this presentation with and will end with is an example of kawa. Uh, the karakia is used to create uh, a safe place. Uh, in the Western paradigm, we might consider this as uh, a culturally safe place and practice. And uh, so it's really important to create the space to include uh, kawa and tikana. So when working with Māori, there are different ways of working that need to be uh, considered and practiced. We want to talk about rangatira tanga, which means leadership and how critical it has been in our indigenization story so far. I will speak about Tatumu Herenga, about this team here, real people committed to the mahi work that we have been outlining. I know this is all very relevant to Kim and Michelle's teams too. So leaders go first and do their learning out loud. This was and still is a vulnerable place to be and a space that we continue to prioritise and invest in as a lead team for our library. We share our own learnings with each other and with colleagues. It's okay to make mistakes, to model our learning with the wider team, to talk about when things go wrong and how we felt. We've also learned, most importantly, the critical nature of a place and a voice at the table for our Indigenous colleagues. A significant step forward for us in partnership and co-governance was the introduction of the Kayarahi role. This is a senior Māori leadership role, our colleagues Abigail and Manahiri, um, that we introduced several years ago. I can't overemphasise the transformational nature of this change for us as individuals working with the Kayarahi as a team in our culture, decision making and perspective and for our wider organisation. It's not just enough to create senior roles, we also have to empower and support the individuals and a key aspect of this is to share the power, to be genuine in this and see where it leads. We, on, the, on our journey, we didn't know where it was going to lead. We didn't know what it would mean, but sharing that power and being in, in the work together, genuinely together, was our goal. So I think as Consul, uh, Michelle, Kim and I can't overemphasise the importance of senior Māori leadership roles. We have them all in our three institutions now and other Consul members do too. They help us understand how to provide services that are representative of and responsive to Indigenous staff and students. We need to employ Indigenous staff at senior levels with enough authority and power to influence decision making and affect real change. They need to be embraced and supported by their team, their whānau, their family, who are fully committed, who will step into the challenge, will step into the discomfort at times and into the learning. I'm now going to talk to you about our recruitment that we've done at the University of Waikato in the library. So last year we underwent a change process that brought about the creation of new Māori and Pacific focused roles. We were very intentional about what roles we needed and that was based on conversations with people like Sue and Kim as well as our existing Māori library staff. We wanted to avoid um, any of our staff undertaking unpaid cultural labour. Once we knew which roles we wanted, we were then able to determine what, which skills, knowledge and experience we needed. This allowed us to really ensure we weren't looking for a unicorn. We know that skills such as fluency in te reo Māori and knowledge of tikanga 
are really in hot demand across organisations in Aotearoa New Zealand. We were then able, because we had a number of roles, to undertake cluster recruitment. And this, of course, had the advantage that all of our prospective candidates could see that we were recruiting for a number of staff and they weren't going to be token Māori staff member asked to undertake unpaid cultural labour. We were also very lucky in that we could advertise these roles very flexibly from 0.6 FTE to full time. We also made it very clear in our job ads that it didn't matter if you had library experience or university experience or not. Um, what really mattered was your commitment to the University of Waikato becoming an anti-racist institution and fulfilling our new library strategy. When we went to interview our prospective um, uh, new staff, we thought very carefully about the tikanga that needed to be in place for that. And that continued on into when we welcomed our new staff into the library. And we did that through a mihi whakato, which is a traditional Māori welcome ceremony. And this ceremony removes the tapu or the restrictions of the manuhiri, the visitors, um, to make them one of the tangata whenua, so the home people. And now our welcome for any new member of staff, whether they're Māori or not, includes elements from that mihi whakato, and it really is that welcome into the library whānau or the library family. As a library, we've also worked very hard um, to co-create our emotional culture. And we've done that through a number of all staff um, library workshops. But really, this is around defining the emotions that we need to feel at work to be successful. And from that, our behaviours and our rituals will come. We've also um, ensured that we understand our obligations and our responsibilities from Te Tiriti O Waitangi. Um, it's been really important to be able to call out systemic and casual racism, and we're working with all our staff to ensure they understand what this means, how they can be an ally, and truly live the values and the emotional culture that we have set. It's my uh, great pleasure to now close our presentation with the karakia. Kia whakaeria te tapu, kia waitia a te ara, kia tūruki whakataka ai, kia tūruki whakataka ai, haumie, huie, tai kie. So thank you, Michelle, Kim and Sue for sharing those insights into the journey that you have been on and we're fortunate to have Michelle and Kim with us later on uh, to engage in our discussions and answer your questions so please do uh, keep reflecting on those and, and add those uh, as they occur. So we'll hear now from Liz Osman. Liz is Head of Humanities and Social Sciences Libraries at Cambridge University as co-convener of Cambridge University Library's EDI Forum for staff, Liz is here to explore the creation and challenges of a new staff development scheme focused on EDI. Liz, over to you. My video, there we go. Right, so thank you so much. Um, as I said, I'm Liz Osman, um, and with my uh, EDI co-convener, um, for EDI Forum co-convener hat on. Um, I'm here to talk about creating a, an EDI programme for library staff. So um, just to uh, say what I'm going to be uh, going through this morning, I'll start off with a little bit of background as to why we started to think about some sort of programme um, and then uh, talk a little around the concept and how I developed the idea. Um, the model I created, um, the three pillars of EDI, I'm calling it, um, working up the full scheme proposal, some of the challenges that we found along the way. And then um, I'll finish with a little bit about piloting and my my hopes and ambitions for the future as well. So um, I'll start with a little bit of background uh, about the context within Cambridge University Libraries. So um, the EDI Forum for Library Staff was launched pre-pandemic. 
and then as with so many of these things it went into abeyance really um, whilst we all just dealt with uh, the last few years so we relaunched the forum in 2022 and also undertook a survey of library staff um, to understand what it was they wanted to see from the forum at uh, a similar time um, university libraries had agreed to get involved with some research from an organisation called Alterline, looking at black student experience in libraries. And they were one of, I think, about 10 institutions to take part. And the feedback from the, that report was, was really interesting. Um, it was all anonymous, so we couldn't pull out Cambridge specific information, but it was it was interesting to see. Um, it showed us quite a few things to give some thought to, but it was focused on student experience. And I think that kind of chimes with, with what I've seen, which is that we as librarians are really good at considering EDI for students and for taking feedback and for seeing how can we improve. But that doesn't always translate across to thinking about our staff and colleagues so much. Um, in the wider university, there are some EDI champions and their roles stretch uh, right across all the staff groups of the university, uh, looking at leadership, at advocacy, facilitation. Um, but really within Cambridge University Libraries, EDI for staff has, I think, traditionally taken a bit of a backseat in comparison to student experience. Um, so the creation of the forum and, and focus on staff is something a bit newer that's been finding its way. Um, so this is a, a small snapshot from the survey that the forum undertook just before I came in as co-convener. Um, so staff were asked, what do you think we should be trying to do with the forum? And I've just put the top three responses to that question here. So as you can see, the, the vast majority of people felt that a priority was supporting, understanding and developing the confidence of staff. Uh, ensuring the community in the widest possible sense understands EDI and how it applies at Cambridge University Libraries. Nearly as many people felt that we should be amplifying voices, so making sure a wide range of people can contribute ideas about how to create an inclusive culture and also encourage and support the leadership team to be making appropriate changes as well. And then the same percentage, 81%, though not necessarily all the same people, um, Felt that they were interested in practical support so really how they could do things themselves in their own local settings um now again that might have been them thinking about a focus on students um but also you know what can you do locally with your library teams and colleagues to ensure that edi is being thought about for them and that there's good practice amongst everyone so with all of that in mind a, a concept started to form for me of some kind of training opportunity to help with EDI for staff. Um, there were some key principles that I felt needed to be behind it. Um, it needed to be available to all staff, regardless of their grades or roles. Um, so this wasn't about training managers. It wasn't something that was 10 minutes in your induction when you first arrived. Um, this wasn't something that only related to people who class themselves as librarians within the teams. I didn't want it to be dependent on a specific level of prior knowledge. I wanted a scheme that would be open to everyone. So uh, some of the early adopters might be those who are already really quite interested or knowledgeable in EDI, but I also wanted it to be available to someone perhaps coming from a, a much lower level of awareness of EDI uh, in all its various forms. It really needed to have a, a light level of administrative burden for it to run successfully. If I was going to be asking um, Helen Murphy or myself as, as the co-conveners of the forum or our local HR department to do an awful lot of work, then it's not really going to work. Um, I also wanted the focus to be on individual learning and improvement. Again, building on that idea of not needing a specific level of starting knowledge. It's all about individual improvement and individual awareness. Um, I thought it was important any sort of scheme had some level of recognition or celebration across Cambridge University libraries. So when you do complete it, it is acknowledged in some manner. And finally, I wanted the scheme to be repeatable. So just because you have taken part in it once, you're still able to do it again at a later date and learn something more. So when it came to developing the idea, there were a, a couple of different things that were touch points for me. Um, first was the SILIP professional knowledge and skills base. 
uh, which is a, a great tool for self-assessment. It's got lots of different areas of focus and you can score yourself and identify areas where you want to develop. Um, that may not be the areas where you have scored yourself lowest, but the areas that you where you feel further development would be helpful. Also, um, the SCONL seven pillars of information literacy, harking back, I think, to my library school days. Um, what I really liked here is, is the actual structure, the idea of pillars. There's a notion of these underpinning concepts and that they are all equal. Um, so thinking about these models and about what I was hoping to achieve led me to my very simple, um, but hopefully effective three pillars of EDI. Um, I must get someone with design skills to make this look fancier at some point. Um, but we have here uh, equality, diversity and inclusion stretching across the top and beneath we have the three pillars. So the first pillar is knowledge, knowledge of EDI. Um, so that might be a really simple thing like knowledge of uh, relevant acronyms. It might be learning about debates around, say, trans women and female only spaces. It might be learning more about protected characteristics and what those mean in law. Uh, then we have behaviours. Uh, so learning about something more active. Um, you might be learning how to be a good ally or an active bystander. And Cambridge University runs courses um, that staff can attend on these topics. But it could also be learning about individual behaviours and the difference they make. So thinking personally, do you want to put your pronouns in Zoom and into your emails? Uh, why might you do that? So the behaviours pillar might mean looking to understand what your behaviours mean for particular communities. Um, and last but certainly not least, professional practice. Um, some element of learning around EDI that is actually transferable or actionable within your role, something you, that you can actively embark on in your job. Um, this model is deliberately very broad. Uh, because thinking about the range of job roles just uh, within Cambridge University Libraries, it's really important that people can identify something within each of these pillars that they would be happy to develop. So professional practice can't just be about how you treat students when they come to you at the inquiry desk. If you're a cataloger, say, and you don't interact regularly with students, there are still lots of things that you could do within your own professional practice. If you're a manager, then you have your team and that is part of your professional practice. Um, so the idea behind the scheme with the pillars underpinning um, was that it will be open and applicable to all staff, uh, regardless of grade, length of service, type of role. Um, to complete the scheme, participants will have to complete five pieces of learning or development that have been identified across the three pillars. So anybody undertaking must identify at least one thing relating to each of the three pillars. They can't just do, say, five bits of knowledge. So five bits of I went away and did some Googling and I learned this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing and this thing. Um, they also have to do at least one piece of behavioural learning or development and uh, one piece that can relate back directly to their working practice. Um, participants will self-assess to decide what their priorities and areas of focus are, though this might be done in relation uh, to conversation with their line managers. Um, but it's really it's for them to reflect on what their current level of knowledge and understanding is and on why they feel they want to learn more. There is flexibility in the learning activities, so there's no list of acceptable courses or activities or anything like that rather than being quite fixed and saying, here is a list of courses you can go on. I want there to be as much freedom as possible because EDI is such a broad area. And the last thing we need to do is kind of close it down uh, through a scheme like this. After each learning activity, um, there will be a period of reflection. And that reflection could be a, a written piece um, or it could be a reflective conversation, perhaps with a manager. Um, but there's a desire really to ensure that um, the learning is reflected on and sort of synthesised. The hope is that anybody who undertakes the scheme can complete it within a year. So it's not supposed to be something that, that becomes a long running feature uh, of anyone's life. And if people can complete it quicker, then that's fantastic. And as I said previously, some form of recognition and visibility of the achievement on completion. Um, there have been some challenges. Uh, naming the scheme 
has actually been one of the biggest ones. Um, so the title of my talk was Library Champions, and you may have noticed I haven't really used that term uh, whilst I've been talking. Champions has meaning uh, elsewhere within Cambridge University, which is uh, suggestive of a far more active role involving advocacy, potentially at quite a senior level. And that's really not something that we're asking people who complete this scheme to do. So the final name is still up for debate and I welcome suggestions in the chat if you want to put them in. Um, I think manager buy-in is always going to be a challenge. We aren't at the point yet where we've hit this barrier, but um, it's going to be a difficult one because I don't want to see that some departments have a really good take up of, of the scheme and other departments, absolutely nobody's got involved um, because the manager is, is not pushing um, that this is, is something to do. Um, administration, how the administration of the scheme will actually work is also still a little up in the air whilst we've been in the creation phase. Um, but it's going to be so important to its success that it is not onerous on any particular individuals. Um, precisely what the reward will be uh, is also open to question. I can say it definitely won't be monetary. Um, you're not going to get an increase in salary for participating in the scheme. I've got some different ideas about what I think we could do. But again, I think those need more conversation. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is actually just been getting to the piloting stage. I'd hoped by the time I was giving this talk that the pilot would be well underway. Um, but that's been a challenge just in terms really of due diligence. So having conversations with people like our HR department, um, even if we're not asking them to get involved directly, they obviously uh, need to check that the scheme is, is going in the right direction um, and that we're not doing anything uh, that's sort of out of step or in conflict with anything else uh, that they're planning. So looking forward, hopefully within the next month, we will be able to put a call out um, for piloting and we'll be looking for about six participants to take part. Um, we hope to um, get people from across a range of different grades, different libraries, uh, different job roles. And really, we're asking that they are enthusiastic uh, and that they will stick with the programme and complete it. But also all we want really is scrupulous honesty. Uh, in their feedback to us and that they'll be quite vocal in giving feedback that the more information we have the better we can understand any changes we might need to make to the scheme. Um, if all goes well then with any tweaks from the, that pilot um, ideally we'll look to launch the scheme fully later this year and promote it and then have a process of continuous assessment going on um, to see whether the scheme is really reaching the objective of improving EDI knowledge and practice um, across uh, our staff members. How we will measure that is another question that is still open to further discussion, but we have some expertise within Cambridge University Libraries that I'm hoping to utilise. Um, hearts and minds is going to be really important. We need to demonstrate uh, to those for whom EDI is a, a really important and personal topic that this isn't just a box ticking exercise or a hollow gesture it is about trying to improve uh, EDI awareness and knowledge across our entire community and we also as I said earlier need to ensure that managers are going to be enablers and not blockers of this scheme. Um, we also want buy-in from all the different staff groups um, so it may be that we need to push a little harder in some areas um, to get, say, security staff, I'm, I'm not picking on them, but just as an example of non-librarians, to get them to understand that this scheme is for them as well, and, and uh, really just to reach a, a normalisation of participation and get to the point where it's just something that, that people do every so often within, within their work. Um, and finally, if, if it all does go really well, um, I really feel that there's the potential to roll it out further. Um, there's nothing in the principles of the scheme that couldn't be translated certainly to another university library or indeed another part of the university organisation. It's deliberately not library specific um, and I think that's really important um, but let's get through the, the piloting stage first. Thank you.
Thank you, Liz, for sharing your insights into how to put together the, the systems and the structures to do this across our libraries. I can see a number of questions coming in already for everyone who's spoken this morning, which is great. I wonder if I might invite everyone to join the panel now and we will start to discuss between us the questions that have come in. So with thanks to everyone for really insightful presentations this morning, some really inspiring work presented, but also some really frank recognitions of the challenges that we encounter, whether that's within our organisations, but also for us as individuals leading and participating in this work. So I hope there'll be plenty for us to explore. Liz, I can't, ah, there we go, <laughs> super. Okay, so thank you all for participating in the discussion and with particular thanks to colleagues from New Zealand where it is very late in the day um, and we'll possibly be entering into tomorrow, I think, as we conclude some of our discussions. So thank you to everyone. I was really struck by some of the commonalities across each of the presentations that we've heard this morning. So we've heard a lot about inclusion activities themselves needing to be inclusive the importance of really conscious effort in creating safe spaces, whether that's through ritual um, and other activities, and also the importance of building confidence. We've also all reflected on some of the challenges that we encounter. And I wonder if I could ask you all initially just about those journeys for you as individuals. What has struck you, has really stood out to you on your own journeys as an important point of learning that you might share for us all? Saying no one's unmuting, I'll go first. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I think for me, um, it's been about being brave and vulnerable um, and, and just being open. Um, so for me personally, having moved back to New Zealand after 15 years in the UK, um, I knew that I knew nothing. <laughs> if that makes sense. So I, I needed to do a whole load of learning, right, and just be open to that. Yeah, I, I think sort of follow, following on from Michelle's point, really, I think um, taking on the uh, the poker meeting, the EDI forum, just opened my eyes to actually how broad EDI is, um, you know, beyond just the protected characteristics that we would talk about in the UK in legal terms. Um, and really that EDI is uh, affecting everyone at some point, even if you, you know, wouldn't necessarily um, identify in any particular way. Um, so I think that was a, a huge learning point in terms uh, of actually just the, the breadth and then thinking about the scheme and well, how do we capture that breadth within the scheme? And it's by, by sort of not um, putting barriers up to it and keeping it as, as open as possible. I think for me on the Mellon Foundation funded project, um, definitely just to echo what's already been said, being open and being brave and uh, putting the imposter syndrome to the side. But I think with this particular project, just bringing people in, um, Jeremy Noltard, the poetry academic and critic, and myself um, had some sort of knowledge and understanding, but wouldn't have been able to begin this project without bringing others in to, to you know, to define what we meant by underrepresented. To also, we had to push back a little bit to Mellon and say, actually, this is underrepresentation in Britain and Ireland, and it's a bit different to you know what might be the case in the states. So there was quite a bit of conversation going on there. But I think by bringing in those other parties, having a genuine consultation, and funding their time, so that there was really a, le a level sort of playing field in terms of who could get involved in the project right the way through. Uh, that was that was really important. I think um, I was also I, on a learning curve in terms of it being my first research project and also being the project manager for it. So yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> quite daunting, but um, I definitely encourage people to, to follow. Um, for me, I think it's that thing again about vulnerability and um, it's okay to make mistakes in this space. If you've created the right environment, then mistakes um, are something to learn from. We have another whakatoki, um, which is uh, ko te hapa te tuakana o te ako, which basically means um, mistakes are the older siblings of learning. So you've got to make them to learn. And uh, that's been really important in this process. So I think it's if you come 
with a opened and authenticity in this space, any EDI space work, then um, you know your intention will be true, and that will get you a long way. So picking up on that theme of authenticity, there's a question here from New Zealand Libraries that I have a feeling you'll all be able to offer reflections on this. And the question is, how have you ensured respectful use of, in this case, Maori culture that doesn't border on appropriation? And asking, did it involve reaching out to local communities to discuss how culture was used in certain environments? But I have a feeling this will also apply when considering how we build representation within collections or build true inclusion in EDI programs. So any reflections on that? Um, I think... Uh... It's the things that Michelle touched on. It, it's really important for this to come and be led by Māori Indigenous staff. Um, and then you won't uh, get that risk of cultural uh, appropriation if it's led by community, it's led by iwi. Um, all our universities have offices of Māori advancement, so there's quite a lot of expertise sitting within our organisations. And I mean, I must say, I'm the only Indigenous university librarian in Aotearoa um, in our eight universities, and I was the first. And I've I've been in uh, the role for seven years, and it's such an indictment, really, on Aotearoa that it's taken this long for an Indigenous person to be leading uh, academic academic library. But it's the same in many of our cultural institutions. So it's not just an issue that we have in higher education, it's um, in a lot of our cultural institutions. Um, and I know that there's more questions about recruiting and things later, but I'll leave it there. Just I just want to add one thing, if Sorry, that's okay, God. to what Kim said. Um, and, and it just goes back to what Kim said in the presentation about the importance of whakawhanangatanga and that um, reciprocity. So actually that has to be genuine. And certainly as someone who, who came in uh, back to New Zealand, um, that was the important piece, right, is being genuine in those relationships, doing what you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to do something, you do it, and you build up that trust, that credibility, but it's not just about you. It's actually that um, that idea of the um, uh, reciprocity that's so important. Um, so I just wanted to, to add that to all the amazing things Kim already covered. So just in relation to the building collections, poetry collections and the Mellon project, um, it's been really important to include the poets in terms of their own curation of the material. So yes, there will be a traditional kind of archive catalogue for each of the deposits that have been made, but we're also inviting the poets to do a creative critical kind of reflection on the project and the process and the material. And then they're taking that material out into the community and running those public library workshops uh, with their archive and encouraging public participation and then that material will go into an exhibition and also be another layer of interpretation in the archive so poet-led um, in terms of how the uh, collections are set but obviously there will still be a moment where a scholar comes into the archive and you know as with all archive collections um, the, the scholar has the freedom to kind of interpret the material as well but they will have this other kind of context sitting around it. Thinking about the um, I suppose the EDI forum a little more widely than just um, the the particular project I'm speaking about, um, we we've almost had uh, sort of the opposite in that um, previously there have been um, some members uh, of of library staff who have uh, put an awful lot of of work and energy into um, initiatives on a voluntary basis, and I was really taken by the kind of unpaid cultural labour. Um, that, that was mentioned in, in the talk from New Zealand librarians. And uh, we're very, very aware that that's exactly what we don't want to do. Um, you know, we we have fantastic diversity across libraries um, in Cambridge, but actually we don't want to say to people or for people to feel that actually, because they happen to have a particular characteristic that they need to come and represent. Um, and that, you know, we're going to pull them in every single time we're doing a project that relates to that particular area. So um, I think actually having the, the forum and having the co-conveners, whilst we are, are not pretending to, to be able to uh, completely represent, is about saying 
we welcome your input and we welcome your support, but we will take this to some extent. We will take some of the, the organizational burden and things like that, but please come to us with all of your ideas and all of your feedback and we want to learn. And if you want to be more involved then you can be, but we're not gonna put the onus onto you because you happen to have a, you know, a, a, a particular characteristic. Um, so I think that's that's been really important um, for us. So Justine, there's a question here for you asking whether the African continent would be eligible in your future consideration for international partnership. Is that how you consider representation in the work you're doing? And is that part of your future ambition? Absolutely. We we want to develop links with international partners. So that would be a, a, a really exciting development. We'd be really keen to make contact um, with anyone working in that area. So, so far we've spoken to colleagues um, um, in some European institutions, America, Canada and Australia, but um, we're very, very happy to, to look further afield. And really, I think because we're in a pilot phase at the moment and we've still got this period until the end of November, is once that period has finished, that's when we'll be starting to talk to other organisations and see if we can put in a, a sort of follow on funding to expand what we've been doing, but with those partners. So please do um, get in touch if, if it's of interest and we'll be making some um, forays out there too. Fantastic. And I can see a number of connections being made in the chat already. So that's a wonderful outcome from a session like this this morning. Uh, to take a couple together now, we have a question about proportions of staff from Indigenous backgrounds in libraries. Also touching on progression, but another question about how uh, customary practice and behaviours, and, and is that tikananga, um, are used within recruitment uh, practices within your library. So I just wonder if you had some reflections on the diversity within your staff body, how you're addressing that in recruitment and progression. So um, how you recruit, um, it's a lot to do with where you recruit and um, about where you advertise. And a lot of it is about networks. Um, in, in our culture, um, relationships are really important. So people might not apply until somebody they trust has told them or knows somebody in the organisation because, you know, they want to know that they'll be safe wherever they go. Um, we also, when we interview uh, in Aotearoa, Aotearoa, New Zealand, we'll start the interview process with uh, mihi, like a greeting, a traditional greeting. We might say a karakia to create safe space. So those are all signals to Indigenous people that it's not just tokenism. You're actually taking the culture seriously and creating a space where they'll feel comfortable to discuss who they are and what they'll bring to the organisation. And the, I just want to pick up on that thing that the cluster recruitment is really important. So, you know, all of New Zealand was really excited when Michelle started advertising her jobs because usually these roles come up and there's sort of like one role. And it was really fantastic to see that there were a whole bunch of them. And the same with Mike Walls down in Otago. He didn't just advertise one or two roles. There were quite a few of them. And that was a really clear signal to the uh, glam sector in Aotearoa that something, there was a fundamental paradigm shift going on in our libraries and that we were taking indigenization and uh, building cultural capacity and knowledge seriously. So, um, you know, props to Michelle and Mike for that. I just want to um, totoku or um, support what Kim said, um, and she was instrumental, and I don't want to let her to get off the hook for this, but for helping um, uh, support me and educate me as well around some of this. So um, it's very much about... Um, you know, um, utilising your networks and learning, and as we said before, being open. I just thought it might be helpful to touch on uh, Shirley's question around, like, the um, the kind of proportion of staff. I think it was Shirley that asked that. Um, so at Waikato, 
we had about 7% Māori and uh, Pacific staff. Um, I haven't included, we have got um, other nationalities, Asian staff, etc. But if I just focus on Māori and Pacific, for example, um, that's gone from 7% to 17% now. And we have 33% at our manager level. Um, I just want to also say we're not done. Like, it's not like it finishes. Um, and I think sometimes people think that, oh, like, you've ticked that box, now you're done. But it's, you know, we, we also don't want just Māori and Pacific staff in Māori and Pacific focused roles. Uh, kind of touching on what Liz said, just because you happen to be Māori or Pacific doesn't mean you want a role that's focused in that, right? You still might want a job as, I don't know, an open research librarian or, you know, what it, whatever it is that you might want to be doing. Um, so we're really conscious of that. And we've just added two new roles, which are student focused roles to try to grow this, which people might be interested in. So we now have a Māori student library assistant um, so that's uh, someone who is a student at the university who's coming in specifically because they're Māori and they're doing uh, different work than say just a regular library assistant because we want to give them a broader experience to show the sorts of roles that are possible and we're looking to recruit a Pacific uh, student library assistant as well so we're in the process of, of doing that um, so I just thought that might be interesting for people as well. Super. And I think that links really nicely to a question for you, Liz, um, when thinking about how those behaviours are inclusive across the staff body. The, the question is, how are behaviour professional practice pieces of action implemented and performed? Do you have evidence, particularly of how staff might evidence this? And did you ensure that colleagues with more flexible job descriptions would also have the ability to perform in these spaces? Yep. So, um in part I can't answer because the scheme is is not quite up and running uh yet um but um within that sort of self-assessment um there is so much breadth as to how people can identify and I think um for a lot of staff we are hoping that there will be some conversation with managers as part of this process um you know partly to say I want to to take on this scheme are you supportive but also for the managers to be able to help if necessary with identifying what those sort of areas might be um but they the the, the, the my whole concept really is that there is nothing that is too pinned down and and nothing that that is too sort of prescriptive um in terms of how one might uh do the learning again I I don't want this sort of scheme to be pinned down to you need to go on a course over here so I think there's an awful lot of learning that can be done you know it, it, it might be reading journal articles it might be going to visit another library and actually talking to people about their practice uh, and and that sort of thing so I, I want to keep it as wide as possible but I do think it's something that we need to explore as the pilot takes off to really understand um, and we may need to, to kind of provide a bit more guidance and a bit more steer on those things but for now I I don't want to pin it down too far I want people to be able to to explore and define uh, their their learning journeys um, quite organically um, and and what feels right for them so just just building on that and and to you Liz but also perhaps more widely there's a question about transferability thinking about the ways that these initiatives can be extended to other marginalised groups with more specific requirements or needs, whether that's learning differences or disabilities in, in sort of practical, inclusive and non-performative ways. I wonder what reflections you might have on that. I really like what Liz was talking about, it, It's oh, and also Justine. Um, most of us are not ever one thing. We're intersectional. And I think the intersectional um, is the interesting piece around, particularly when you're dealing with marginalised communities. So um, it, it's it's really difficult when you start putting people in boxes because you're not ever getting one thing. Um, I think the aim in most of our libraries is exactly that. It's around equality, diversity, um, it's inclusion, it's it's all those three things. In Aotearoa New Zealand, our context is different because of Te Titi or Waitangi and that contract with Indigenous people. So we have a whole other layer that we need to deal with. But we're also very much about 
equity, diversity and inclusion and any work that we do in the indigenization and um, decolonization space intersects with that EDI piece as well. So if you're doing indigenization work, you're also doing EDI work. And then if you're doing EDI work, then you're doing ally work. And it's all about um, diversifying our profession, which we really need to do. We need to be representative of our community. It's about the types of organisations we're building, isn't it? And how we get uh, that sort of attitude and intent and, and inclusion running right the way through everything that we do. There's a specific question here, which is touching on the histories and perhaps some of the power dynamics around this. The question is around the institutional archive and whether there can be a lack of trust and how that's addressed. The question is about Maori, but I think it very much applies as well to the work you're doing, Justine about situations in which there has been an, an, an historical silencing um, and I'm wondering how you address that and how you build up trust necessary to navigate them. So I think in relation to the Mellon Foundation project, um, the there is sort of pre-existing work had already been done in terms of research. And so the poetry academic Jeremy Noel Todd already had links with um, Sandeep Palmer and some researchers working in this area and an organization called the Ledbury, Ledbury Poetry Critics. So I think um, there was already um, a relationship of trust between um, some of the poetry community and the institution, um, but a lot needed to be done to, to build on that. In terms of um, the storehouse model, um, I think that's a really great way for poets who wouldn't traditionally see, you know, the poets that we're contacting wouldn't traditionally see how they fit within the collections within a, an institution, um, can see that model and see that it's something they can they can try and they can withdraw their materials later. So that helped to build trust as well. So I think um, institutional practices tend to be quite different um, in, the, in those traditional models of either taking it and it's ours now or you know we're buying it off you and then we can do with it whatever we like. Um, so I think throughout the methodology and through the different consultations thing I think that just uh, continuing to have conversations and build relationships and be willing to change our methodology um, to adapt that's been kind of key for us if that answers the question. <laughs> Um, I would say um, I agree with Justine and that there's nothing hugely different. It's about the relationship building. It's about um, being credible and doing if you if you commit to doing something, doing that um, and building that trust incrementally um, to show that you're genuine. And as I said earlier, as Kim said in the presentation, that um, idea of um, reciprocity is so important. Um, so I, I think um, for a for, for me at Waikato, one of the big markers was obviously listening and then um, making um, very intentional decisions that we were going to recruit to these um, five. There were six uh, roles, but there were five that we were recruiting for. So five brand new roles. And as Kim described, that went out as a kind of cluster recruitment. And that was quite a big signal um, to people as well that we were serious. And then when our staff started to arrive, building on that. So um, when there were, um, uh, and I'm not going to pretend that, that this doesn't exist, but when we have racial microaggressions happening, we tackle those. We don't um, just let them lie. So, you know, that's been quite confronting for a lot of staff, but I would also, um, you know, um, really recognize how my staff have fully lent into that as well, because they are difficult conversations. And um, there, there are people who haven't realized the impact that they have on others. So their intention is one thing, but it's their impact, right? And if you don't, if no one tells you that's the impact you're having, how can you learn and how can you grow? It's a question here about the other side of this, and, and you've all touched in different ways about avoiding unpaid labour, the importance of building capacity to do cultural labour. Uh, the question is that people from underrepresented groups should not, should not be burdened about who leads and who is empowered. Um, 
and this was raised by each of you in different ways. I was wondering if you had any further thoughts and reflections on this. I think there's a there's a really difficult balance to find which is that there is no expectation being put on anyone that because of who they are they they must do this extra stuff but that equally by not putting the burden on them we have to ensure that they're still being represented and and that they still have a voice and they're not therefore marginalized because they're not having to do the extra work if you see what I mean so I think um, as as the co-conveners of the EDI forum, we Helen and I are, are, you know, incredibly aware all the time that whilst we can facilitate, we cannot speak with authority for everybody that we are representing. Um, so we there is still some some reliance really on on all of our colleagues to uh, to talk to us, but the hope is that we're taking some of that burden of of administration of organization um, and that we are giving them more choice about how they want to engage rather than there being a a vacuum that they then feel they need to fill um, because nobody else is talking about these things and nobody else is doing anything but I think it, it, it is very difficult I sit here knowing that you know I'm I'm not x y and z and yet I'm sitting here in, you know, as an EDI person. So it it, it is uh, kind of coming to terms with that and, and trying to find ways that enable people to, to feel that they can be involved and that they are being represented whilst at the same time not um, pushing them into, into that kind of more tokenistic or um, free labour kind of model. Um, Sue did touch on this a little bit in the presentation, but um, I guess it's about power sharing as well. And so one of the things that we've tried really hard to do in all of our universities is um, recruit Indigenous people at all different levels, but particularly in the senior leadership teams. So they are driving the changes. Um, and um, and never alone. So I've got a really good friend when we created a role at University of Auckland, she works in the private sector in an IT company, and that was her, the best advice I ever got was you never create these roles alone. And I, I think it's, it's the same for other marginalised groups. They want to know that there are going to be safe spaces for them with other people like them. Um, and if it's not within the library, then the broader organisation. So um, I think the other thing that, that we can do is actually work um, across the organisation because there's a lot of goodwill in the EDI space and libraries don't have to do this work on their own. But also foreign like this are really fantastic opportunities to build those networks and kind of you know, hear what other people are doing and go, I mean, you know, there's a lot of DMing and conversations going on, I know, here today. And that's that's the best, you know, you talk to people about what didn't work and what is working. So just picking up on, on that theme of what didn't work, there are a couple of questions here thinking about resistance or barriers that we might encounter and, and we'll probably have to make this our last theme but one of the questions is whether you have encountered barriers within the organization as you've attempted to take forward this work and if so how you've navigated that oh I'll be honest my main barrier was trying to do a massive change proposal but that's quite a different sort of barrier <laughs> that makes sense because no one likes to change process but I wrote in the chat that actually it wasn't it wasn't a negative change process in the fact that I, I was trying to make redundancies or anything it was about changing the work we did based on a new strategy for the library and that's a really big thing right and then I, I would reflect that the other the other major thing has been around fear for staff so it's fear of the unknown right so trying to ensure that staff can be comfortable being uncomfortable is what we talk about like because you want to challenge people you don't want them to continue with some of the 
behaviors that might be taking place but doing that in a way where they feel safe to be challenged um, and and how we do that is really critical so a lot of that um, relies on the staff that we recruit, the way that we have those conversations, the culture that we set in our organisations. Um, so it's not just one thing, it's a whole series of things. Um, one of Sue's staff said in a recent presentation that we did together, and she's um, a senior leader, a Māori Indigenous senior leader, said that I feel safe to be Māori in my library. And it was one of the best things I've ever heard. And I think we all just want to feel safe where we are. Um, but it's all, it's often a barrier, um, not feeling safe to be yourself. Um, I think there are really huge barriers institutionally in that, you, you know, like a handful of people cannot decolonize a whole organization. So the framing and you have to be really realistic about what you can achieve because otherwise you're just not going to succeed um, and always uh, in partnership and in collaboration. So um, there are a lot of barriers, but you shouldn't let them stop you. It's a great question, Ed. You should just, you know, one foot in front of the other and keep going. Just wanted to say something about the Mellon Foundation project, actually. So for six months, uh, I worked with a, poetry critic and academic um, on this funding proposal and although we were consulting others we didn't want to take up too much of people's time because we weren't sure if the funding would actually come through or not so actually we, uh, and Mellon wanted us to be very specific about how things would go they gave us the brief of you know community led and we defined that we defined the methodology we had to literally produce agendas for meetings that were happening two years ahead with how many cups of tea people would have it was a very granular uh, budget narrative and, and bid that we had to put together but the great thing is um, that when we brought in Will Harris, the poetry fellow, and looked at our methodology together and, and adapted it, and Will was suggest making suggestions for changes, that Mellon were very open about that, particularly as it was community-led. And so it was easy to go back to Mellon and say, actually, we're going to move some of this funding around because it's going to make the project better. It's going to make the outcomes better. It's going to make the impact better. And that funder was uh, really welcoming of that. Um, so I think that that really helped in terms of very, at the very back in 2015 coming up with the storehouse model I was lucky to have a very open-minded library director um, and in uh, Nick Lewis and uh, sitting down and saying look this is what libraries do when they're collecting archives they literally it's like you know you either get it for 20 years or you buy it or you know it's a donation we're not going to be able to do these kind of innovative things without changing the model and Nick uh, went away and you know we had some more discussions and the model came into being so without that uh, you know open-minded leaders um, who are willing to to try things um, that would be very difficult but worked out well <laughs> at UEA. Yeah I think um, Cambridge University Labs have been incredibly supportive um, of, of developing um, the scheme I think that the only um, problem really has just been the time it has taken to to sort of take things to people and consult with them and and then sort of you know do an iteration and, and come back I think just um, you know the, the kind of committee structure and everything that that we all come up against that just actually uh, slows slows things down um, but actually the support that I've had and and the really useful feedback has been great um, so the, the the support is there it, it is just the time to grind through the formalities Super. So I think this will have to be our last question. There's a question reflecting on the challenges of developing an emotional culture within an organisation, which doesn't always foster that way of being, that way of being for our whole selves. It's framed here as asking how you work through certain barriers, but we've touched on that. So I wonder if I might reframe it slightly and offer an invitation for each of you to share as you are comfortable to do so about your own emotional journey, whether you've encountered difficulties and how you overcome that, or perhaps just what you are particularly proud of or take delight in as you've navigated this. Um, for me, it's... Uh, I came back to Aotearoa after 27 years of living in Australia 
And a bit like Michelle, it's um, you can't undertake this work if you don't start decolonizing yourself. Um, and it is it is hard. Um, and for, as an Indigenous person um, who didn't speak Reo, our language, when we came back, um, and feeling whakama, which means embarrassed about that, it's it has been uh, uncomfortable. And it remains so, but it I just have to do it. It's important. Um, as as I mentioned, the only Indigenous university librarian. Um, that means that I have kind of a responsibility. Um, and I don't take that lightly. And if I want others to be on the journey, if I want our libraries to do it, then I have to be there and um do it as well. So yeah, it's it requires bravery and courage, but I'm really fortunate that I have uh, amazing colleagues uh, to work with and uh, friends who are also on similar journeys. So that that makes such a difference. Um, so I might just touch on two things. One is that for me, I think my journey around some of this started when I was back in the UK, particularly um, uh, with Black Lives Matters and things like that, and starting to educate myself around anti-racism. Um, and I was at, uh, for those that don't know, I was at the University of York before, which is very white, kind of middle-class university. Um, and it was a very different environment to what I've come in at, to at Waikato. But I'm really grateful for all the learning that I had at York and the conversations with colleagues, et cetera, and starting to do a lot of learning and relearning um, about things. And there was something, and I, and I apologize because I could not remember which book this was in, but it basically was my light bulb moment about anti-racism, which said, if you're not doing anything, then you're complicit in the system essentially. And for me, that was such a big light bulb moment that when I, came and arrived back in New Zealand um, I, I was just really conscious that I was coming uh, to a university that was very different to where I'd been before etc and that I needed to be really open to just listening and learning um, and then I'll just talk a little bit about what we've done at Waikato around that emotional culture which I mentioned in the presentation we've been really intentional about this and used a tool called the emotional culture deck if anyone's interested I'll put a link in the channel it's a New Zealand company people like Air New Zealand use them and we have co-created with our library staff the emotional culture we all need to feel at work to be successful in the work that we do and that is what we hang everything Thing back on. So when we experience things like racial microaggressions, we can go back to the emotional culture we've set as a library and we can have conversations that say, so, um, you know, th this happened, this was the impact, you know, does that fit with being and our five things are uh, connected, supported, appreciated, fun loving and open minded. And it's really easy to connect back to those and think about the behaviours and rituals that need to come to make people feel that way. So it's actually given us a really good tool for language to be able to have these conversations with staff. I think I still feel that I'm, I'm very much still on a journey. Um, you know, I'm quite new to senior leadership. So actually thinking about what does that mean? How do how do I need to, you know, think about the behaviours that I'm modelling, um, think about actually how open I, I should be about things. Um, and certainly you know, in terms of the EDI forum, recognising that I am, I am a facilitator, but I am not a representative. And I think my my learning, my EDI learning journey is is you know, I'm nowhere near, there is no end for starters, and I am nowhere near it. So I think the hardest thing is, is actually kind of um, recognising that I am not an expert, whilst I might appear to be in a position where people would look to me to, to, to think I am an expert. So um, worrying about saying the wrong thing, which I hear from so many staff, is, is you know, an anxiety they have. I absolutely share that. In, in a huge way because I have put myself in a position where I feel even more vulnerable if I did say the wrong thing. Um, but it's so important to just be able to say, well, I am still on this learning journey and I will never stop being on it because, you know, EDI never ends. Um, 
and just to be able to to say I I want to know more I want to be better I want to be doing the best for all of my friends and colleagues and uh, trying to understand um their problems their needs um and yeah but it's it's all it's all still very new um and I think being in a leadership role is is an extra challenge just in terms of um that representation um and that expectation on you so I really liked what Kim and, and Michelle were saying about just being really open and authentic and owning up to mistakes because I think that is that is the responsibility that we have um, because at the end of the day we are all human and we will get it wrong just to echo that really, I feel as I'm very much at the beginning of this project and uh, want to progress and, and develop more collections, but um, was very much afraid of getting it wrong at the beginning. And it's gradually through uh, sitting down and being honest and open about that with the poets has really helped um, and learning a lot along the way. Um, I also think one of the journeys aside from EDI related um, is the just the first time being on a research project and, and being a project manager and managing a big budget around that. So there's been, it almost feels like starting my career again in some ways, but obviously bringing with me my um, professional support kind of background to um, some of this as well. So I think um, it's been really, really exciting and really rewarding and I definitely recommend it both um, you know, building collections of this type and also embarking on research projects and, and encouraging research-led uh, initiatives in the library.